talk to you about next is called the Swiss cheese model of defense. And I actually think this was developed by the automotive industry, but it's a model, it's a concept that we use for lots of different things. And the idea is that the more layers of defense we have, the more likely we'll be successful. So if you think about Swiss cheese, it has a lot of holes in it, all right? And so if we imagine that this person over here on the left has COVID and is releasing particles into the air, and this person over here does not have COVID, we think about the different layers that we can use to protect the person on the right from the virus particles that the person on the left has. No layer, no one thing is absolutely perfect, absolutely 100%. They all have a hole in them. But the more layers of defense that we use, the better we can do to um, reduce the chance that this person on the right gets exposed to COVID. So I'm curious, what are some ideas that you have that we could do to reduce risk of COVID at school? Maybe there, these are things that you've seen in other places that you've been. But how might we be able to reduce COVID at schools? All right. So um, one of you wrote, we need to improve school cleanliness. Somebody suggested having small class groups. Um, someone thought maybe it'd be helpful to wear gloves. Uh, maybe we need to keep our distance from each other. These are great ideas. Maybe we need to get vaccinated. Practicing good hygiene. Great answers. Gonna give us about 15 more seconds. Another get vaccinated, another, oh, two more get vaccinated. Ooh, someone raised a great idea of having lunch times um, at different times so that we're avoiding large gatherings in the cafeteria. These are awesome. I see the future of public health right here in Oakland Unified School District. So let's talk about which of these things are gonna be really helpful and which ones we don't need to worry about quite as much. So when I think about the way COVID spreads, there's three things that need to happen. There has to be someone who's infected who has droplets leaving their body. Those droplets need to survive in the air and then they need to get into another person's eyes, nose, or mask. And so we're going to talk about some different things that we can do for each step of this happening. Like for step one, there's certain actions we can take to reduce the chance of that happening. And same for step two and step three. So let's talk a little bit about how school might be different to keep us healthier. One big difference is we're going to need to screen ourselves for symptoms. So a lot of the time when we think about COVID, we think about cough, fever, um, body aches. And these are COVID symptoms, but there's a lot of other COVID symptoms, especially in younger people. So COVID can look like um, shortness of breath. It can look like muscle or body aches. It can look like a headache. It can look like loss of taste or smell. It can look like a sore throat. It can look like nausea or vomiting or diarrhea. It can look like a runny nose. And so two years ago, most of the time, if we got a runny nose, we wouldn't think twice about it before going to school. But things are different now. Before school, we're going to need to screen ourselves for symptoms and be really honest with ourselves and our schools about if we're having them. So when should you stay home? When should a student stay home? If anyone's having new unexplained symptoms themselves or somebody that they live with within the last 24 hours, that's a reason to stay home and to get tested. If anybody at home is waiting for a COVID test result, 
um, that's not like a routine one for work, that's a reason to stay home and to distance learn that day. If anyone's had a high risk exposure, meaning within six feet for more than 15 minutes of someone who's positive, that's a reason to stay home. So one big difference with school this year is going to be that you'll, um, you, you'll sign on to Parent Square and do a symptom screen before coming to school. If we don't have people coming with symptoms, that's going to help all of us stay healthier and help reduce the risk of COVID for all of us. By now, you all know a lot about masking. Um, and I'm just going to make a couple points about masking. One is that a mask is only going to be helpful if you wear it the right way. And by that, I mean it should fit closely. It should cover your nose and it should cover your mouth. Okay. Um, double masking has been um, shown to provide extra help. And so for folks who are feeling um, nervous, it's a great idea to come with a double mask. One thing that I think people that people didn't really know at the beginning of this pandemic, but I think a lot more people are understanding are that valved masks are dangerous. So this mask here has a valve and this kind of mask is designed for um, like a construction site or where there's fire. And the way they work is you can't breathe in anything from the outside, but what you exhale comes out and it actually comes out kind of concentrated in a stream. And so for a smoky environment, that's great. You can breathe in, you let out your air. But when we're worried about disease and infection, we don't want you letting your air out. And so that's why it's really important not to wear a valved mask. Those are dangerous. One of you mentioned it's important to give space. So in general, six feet is a good idea. Where does this number six come from and why is it changing? So where this comes from is that most of our droplets fall within three feet. And so once upon a time, they said, well, let's be extra safe. Let's double it to six feet. And that's where six feet came from. What we're learning though, is that because most droplets fall within three feet, there are times, there are situations where three feet apart is okay. And so you will hear different things. You will hear three feet, you will hear six feet, and you now know where that comes from. I'd say err on the side of caution for now, stay six feet away. But over time, we may have more research um, that continues to suggest that three feet's pretty safe. The other thing I want you to know is that if you're coughing or sneezing or yelling or um, screaming, your droplets are gonna go a lot farther. So if you're really excited, if you're shouting, try to give yourself a little more space because your droplets can go up to 20 feet in those situations. All right, a lot of you brought up gloves. I have great news for you. You don't need gloves and that's great because gloves are uncomfortable, they make your hands sweaty, um, they're messy, they cause a lot of waste. You don't actually need gloves to stay safe from COVID. What you need is clean hands. And I know historically it's been rough, at least in the bathroom I go to, finding soap. But the great news is this has really become a priority to make sure that we've got soap and paper towels and hand sanitizers all over the school. And so as long as we're washing our hands before we touch our eyes, our nose, or our mouths, we're protecting ourselves from the small chance that there could be COVID transmission from surfaces. In the media and in um, like restaurants and retail, there's been a lot of focus on this idea of deep cleaning and we're cleaning things all the time. But the, at the end of the day, the goal is that we're not getting COVID in our eyes, nose, or mouths. And so if we are washing our hands, that deep cleaning plays much less of a role. When should you get tested? There are a number of reasons, but two of the main ones is if you're having new symptoms or if you've had a high risk exposure, more than 15 minutes for more than, um, 
within six feet. There may be other reasons. And if you're wondering if you should get tested, please talk to your healthcare team, okay? To your school-based health clinic or to your doctor, to your nurse practitioner, to your school nurse. But two of the big ones that should trigger testing for you are whether you're having any new symptoms and if you've had a high-risk exposure to COVID. So I just talked about a lot of stuff and I'm going to pause for questions. So May asked, how do you know if a not so noticeable symptoms like runny nose is the symptoms of COVID, not just a runny nose or a sign of another disease? May, that is such an excellent question. Um, so some folks have th symptoms that they know is due to something else. So I have allergies. So every day I've got a stuffy nose, every single day. If that runny nose changes, right? Like normally every day I have a little bit of clear fluid, but if that changes, if I'm like, wow, that's a lot worse, that should make me think, hmm, this is different. Maybe I should get tested. Some people have diseases that affect their stomach. So maybe they often feel nausea or sometimes they have loose stools. But if things seem to be happening differently, that's when you'd say, oh, that's a new symptom. And let's say I have a new runny nose. I don't know if it's COVID or if it's one of the thousands of other viruses out there unless I get tested. And that's why new symptoms for us should prompt us to get tested. Someone asked a great question in the pair deck. They said, how many symptoms should I have to know if I have COVID? That is such a good question. And the answer is, it might only be one symptom. Sometimes people have just a headache or just a sore throat. Many people have no symptoms at all. And that's why we don't just go back to everything like normal. That's why we need to wear masks and we need to distance. But even just one symptom can be COVID. And so if you have one new symptom or someone in your house has one new symptom, please go ahead and get tested. Um, can someone get COVID even with the vaccine? Great question. I'm gonna let Dr. Rivera take that in the next session. So hang on to that question. Um, if we are reopening school, and of course we have to wear masks, how can younger kids like elementary ones wear masks? Great question. So there's two pieces to this. One is elementary students are much less good at getting COVID than older kids. We think that's because they have less ACE2 receptor and they're not good at getting it from each other. So most of the time when elementary students get COVID, it's from an adult. Um, and what's great is adults can wear their masks and many adults have been vaccinated. Another thing is that elementary students are amazingly teachable. Just as they can learn to raise their hand or make a line or wash their hands, they also can learn to wear their masks. Um, but remember, this is why we have lots of layers of protection. So masks are really, really, really helpful. But there's other things that can be done to protect students as well. Um, it looks like May is raising her hand. May, would you like to unmute and ask your question? How will we eat school lunch? Great question. And the answer is going to be different by school. So in some schools, there might be different cafeteria times. In some schools, you might eat in a classroom. In some schools, you might eat outside. But that's going to be different school by school because each school has a different layout and a different situation. Christian, Amara, any other questions I should make sure to address before um, we take our break? I don't think so. I think we're good. 
All right, I will move us on to the next slide. 